Project Gemini, two weeks in space. Today, the final act. Recovery of Gemini 7 astronauts Borman and Lovell. Now from the CBS News Space Center in New York, Walter Cronkite. Good morning, everyone, from our CBS News Space Center for uh, very probably the last of these reports in this remarkable series of flights by Gemini 7 and 6. Gemini 7, with Frank Borman and Jim Lovell aboard, is now out over the Indian Ocean on its last of 206 revolutions of the Earth. In another uh, hour from now, it should be splashing down in the Atlantic, some 678 miles southeast of Cape Kennedy, from which it took off 330 hours and 35 minutes before. It will have traveled some 5,716,900 miles, and uh, astronauts Borman and Lovell are hoping to bring it down closer than 13.4 miles from the uh, target ship, the aircraft carrier WASP because they have a bet that they can beat the landing uh, on target of Gemini 6 on last Thursday, and that's where they landed. Paul Haney now in Houston. And our retrofire this morning should take place over the equator, about 3,000 miles east of the Philippines. The Canton Island station should monitor that sequence. And then the crew, some 36 to 37 minutes later, should splash down at a point 690 miles east of the Cape, or about 10,000 miles from their retrofire point. This is Gemini Control, Houston. All is well in the uh, spacecraft. Borman and Lovell reported uh, just a little while ago that their spacecraft was clean as a whistle, meaning they had finished stowing all of the gear and the debris accumulated during two weeks in space. They've got the uh, two uh, yaw thrusters that uh, went out a couple of days ago working again. They'll have full facilities uh, to align their spacecraft in just the proper position for that retrofire over the Pacific. Uh, now coming in about 25 minutes from now. Their orbit is about what it has been, very little decay in that orbit. They're 189 miles high at their highest point, 182 miles at their lowest point. They are back in their space suits. The, uh, their position on the ground, Dr. Charles Berry says that they are tired but in perfectly good shape. They were asked, are you ready to come home? Borman said, ready, ready. And Lovell said, righto. So they will be coming back a little less uh, than an hour from now. While Gemini 7 is making its final preparations for rectifier, let's take a look at how it looked in orbit to Gemini 6. These are the remarkable films taken from Gemini 6 of Gemini 7. This was the rendezvous on last Wednesday. The, apparently these pictures taken from Shiraz's side of the uh, Gemini 6 spacecraft, the left uh, co command pilot seat. You see the nose of the Gemini 6 in the foreground and Gemini 7 in the back. Remarkably clear pictures. They're at this point 185 miles high speeding along at 17,500 miles an hour, and you get an idea of that speed by the turning of the Earth below. Cloud cover there. And because the precise time of these pictures has not been given to us, we don't know what part of the Earth's surface they were over. However, it was likely the eastern United States or western Africa, since that was the daylight part of their pass and these pictures were taken in daylight. Sensational view of Gemini 7 in flight. First time, of course, this has ever been accomplished because it's the first time the two spacecraft have ever rendezvoused. First time there has been a platform to take a picture of another spacecraft in orbit. This is the uh, spacecraft with its adapter and equipment sections still attached. 
All of that white section is jettisoned before the spacecraft splashes down again into the Atlantic. You can see just barely there some of that uh, trailing wire material that uh, Gemini 6 commented upon. They noted that the Gemini 7 was a pretty scruffy looking spacecraft commenting to on the wires and the debris hanging out there and back. Gemini 7 said to Gemini 6, you don't look so hot either, words to that effect. Uh, these are uh, pieces of equipment that have no uh, function in space and do not uh, interfere with the operation of the spacecraft quite clearly. So Gemini 7 is on its 206th revolution. It's over the Indian Ocean approaching Australia. It will be firing its uh, retro rockets in some 21 minutes from now over the Pacific and will be splashing down at five minutes after nine, 58 minutes from now. CBS News color coverage of Project Gemini resumes in a moment. is for people who want taste in a cigarette and plenty of it. Come on over to the l and side, just for the taste of it. Venez tous du côté l and m Venez-y comme tous les gens du goût. Venez donc, vous serez contents de vous. Oui, venez tous du côté l and m Come on over to the l and m side. Just for the taste of it. There's been one uh, interesting development this morning in the conversations between uh, Borman and Lovell and uh, Mission Control in Houston. Uh, they have expressed a uh, desire to leave the spacecraft uh, just as soon as it's on the surface of the uh, Atlantic Ocean rather than waiting for the spacecraft to be lifted aboard the aircraft carrier WASP as uh, did uh, Shira and Stafford. Uh, they, they want to get out right away. They were reminded by Dr. Barry that he preferred for them to remain in the spacecraft. Uh, he wants uh, them to uh, be able to leave the spacecraft and go immediately to medical debriefing rather than have a period in between there in which they'd be in the helicopter and then aboard the WASP. He feels that would uh, uh, jeopardize some of his experiments. Uh, but uh, he said it is, will be entirely up to the astronauts. It's been their choice all along. Uh, it is curious, however, that Borman and Lovell uh, would uh, want to defy that last minute of the experimentation when everything else has gone so fine. But quite obviously, after 14 days in there, they want to get out. It will remain to be seen just exactly what does transpire. But if they're any further away from the uh, carrier than were Shira and uh, Stafford, it's highly likely, it seems now, that they will elect to leave the spacecraft and come back aboard the WASP by helicopter. Well, the big problem, of course, uh, for them in the last 24 hours, not a problem so much as just a chore, is to clean up the house in which they've lived for 14 days in space. And out at our uh, Gemini uh, mock-up spacecraft out at St. Louis, where they're built at the McDonnell Aircraft Plant. Our man Bill Stout and McDonald's man Bob Sharp can probably tell us what's been going on in that capsule over the last 24 hours. Bill? They certainly had plenty of housekeeping, Walter, just putting away all the objects that they've been using, some of it uh, floating around inside the spacecraft. Right now, Bob, what would they be occupied with on the instrument panels? Uh, right now, they're uh uh, preparing for their uh, retrofire maneuver. For the last uh, two hours or so, they've been aligning their platform. I think this is the uh, one thing that they were doing to uh, try and get a perfect alignment to try and beat Wally Shiraz's touchdown distance since they had a little uh, competition on that affair. Uh, <clears throat> their uh, platform is a, uh, a uh, device that's a reference uh, gyro, a highly sophisticated gyro, much as a boys are a child gyroscope top and uh, so they've uh, th this is the key to a, a real accurate reentry reference 
Aside from the general untidiness of two men who have lived as close as you and I are for 14 days, what do you think was the uh, biggest part of the, the stowage chore, tidying up before retro fire? Well, I don't know if there was a biggest part of it. It was just a, a chore that encompassed uh, probably a large part of uh, yesterday's activities. And this includes getting rid of all their cameras, stowing them back in the boxes o overhead, uh, placing certain items in the pouches at the side, getting rid of all the uh, plastic wrappers from their food packages, stowing those underneath uh, their seats and receptacles that are provided for them. Uh, and the food boxes which lie behind their seats, they have uh, both camera gear and other uh, waste stowage, uh, urine samples and so on that has to be all put away and secured. And of course, Walter, as I think any man can understand, uh, probably both of them are just uh, terribly anxious for a shave after two weeks of living that close to a stubble, much of the time inside a helmet at that. Right, uh, Dale, they've reported, as we said before, that they've got uh, the, their stowage taken care of, and they're working now, as Bob suggested, on uh, the uh, events immediately preceding retrofire. They have to power up, as it's called, turning on all of their equipment, getting it ready for the uh, reentry maneuvers, the last uh, critical point of their 14-day flight. One of the big problems in that stowage now uh, with the Gemini spacecraft is that it be stowed precisely uh, where it belongs uh, and early enough so that the ground can help, uh, uh, can help monitor uh, exactly where the center of gravity is, which is a determining factor in using the lift capability of the Gemini spacecraft and finding its proper landing spot. You're seeing pictures from the aircraft carrier WASP, this on the hangar deck uh, below the flight deck. Uh, the WASP standing by there some 700 miles southeast of Cape Kennedy for the recovery this morning. Uh, the live television cameras that gave us that exciting coverage of the uh, return of Shira and Stafford on uh, Thursday, standing by to repeat the performance today with uh, the return of Borman and Lovell. The uh, spacecraft seven is now, as you see, off the, uh, just over the northwestern coast of Australia. We're going to be getting a report from the WASP uh, very shortly. We heard also earlier this morning that uh, Mission Control had reminded uh, the uh, seven astronauts that Gemini 6 got quite a jolt when their main chute deployed and they were brought to a landing position. We'll hear more about that later. Let's go to Dallas Townsend on the WASP now. This is Dallas Townsend aboard the aircraft carrier WASP, the carrier which is now heading at flank speed for the area where preliminary information indicates that the GT-7 spacecraft will come down in the Atlantic. Already we see to be traveling at around 30 knots and the wind is whipping over the deck and the WASP's aircraft are tuning up on the flight deck four levels below us, ready to take off. There are 11 of them, six helicopters, two twin-engine Grumman trackers, and three single-engine Douglas Sky Raiders. Those are the radio relay planes. The twin-engine planes are the command planes, one for Air Boss 1 and the other for Air Boss 2. Air Boss 1, the man who is the on-scene commander for this operation and the recovery of the spacecraft, is Commander David Barksdale. It's a fine, bright, warm morning out here in the Atlantic with just a little bit of cloud cover, light winds, seas no more than three feet, and a beautiful morning for recovery. My colleague Bernard Eisman is down on the flight deck. Bernie, what's the situation down there? Dallas down here in the prop wash. It's just one minute, 60 seconds from the launch of aircraft, which means it'll be 50 minutes from estimated splashdown time at 9.05 Eastern Standard Time. In less than one minute now, now, those first aircraft should be leaving the flight deck, and we'll have the first section of our launch away. What's it like from up there? Well, Bernie, it's a picture of color and noise and uh, organized confusion at the moment. As you can hear, the uh, sound is quite deafening. The uh, three search helicopters are warming up on the forward part of the flight deck. So are the uh, twin engine and the single engine planes. The three swim helicopters haven't yet turned up their engines, but they will be very shortly. They, of course, don't leave the deck until, until 20 minutes before splashdown. Bernie, once again, down to you. 
The swimmers are in their helicopter. They're on the midship section of the flight deck, and they are ready to go with a second launch. Bernard Eisman aboard the carrier Wasp.